Previously on Direct Appeal. It was worse than I thought it was. He's either there with somebody or at best he's in some backdoor card game. I was raging. I was pissed. So I figured, you know what? What better way to get back at him? I'm going to move his car someplace downtown to some seedy motel. Good luck finding it. Now at this point, my heart is pounding out of my chest because part of me is scared shitless that he's going to come out of one of these rooms. I have no opportunity to go anywhere near the state of Virginia. I want to sell everything. I don't want anything left from this life. That's it. It's done. And then before she left again, she looked at me. She said, he's really not in the trunk of your car. You know, I had managed to really put off any concern until that time because he could be anywhere doing anything. And my mother called me and said that police had been by. He was sorry to inform me, but my husband had passed away in Virginia. This is episode five, Human Sawdust. So they informed her of his death on May 26th. Was it almost immediately that they started looking at her? You know, quite frankly, I think they already were looking at her. Really? Uh, I'm pretty sure that they were already thinking Just because that's the logical person anytime. Yeah, we know. We know that we're going to look at a spouse anytime. So I think they were looking to her. But now it's become more of an official investigation because he is actually deceased because they know he was murdered. And you have the investigation beginning in Virginia Beach because this is where, you know, Bill was found. And Officer Ray Pickell uh, is one of the lead officers. He'll also come to testify at the trial. He and another detective come up from Virginia to New Jersey to interview Melanie. Now, they've requested an interview with Melanie. Melanie has agreed. Uh, She's agreed to an interview. She has a divorce lawyer at this time. So she is going to have her divorce lawyer present. I think her divorce, a divorce lawyer at the time advised her not to do an interview, but she consented. So, but what good would a divorce attorney do? Because she, I mean, obviously she doesn't have a defense attorney at this point. She doesn't have criminal counsel. Okay. So she doesn't have criminal counsel at this time. I guess it's some counsel, at least maybe. Are they doing it for free? It doesn't, I mean, is she paying them extra for this? It just doesn't make sense. I'm imagining she's paying part of it. You know, I think it's because, again, she doesn't have, she doesn't have defense counsel this time, as Melanie will say. She has no idea that she's under any type of investigation Mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, she knew, or she knew that she was going to be looked at, but she didn't know, she didn't know how real this was going to get yeah. for her. So let's hear her talk a little bit about uh, her interview that she initially gave to Officer Piquel. I had gotten a call, um, as I was intermittently, from the Woodbridge Police Department asking me, you know, hey, have you heard from him? Do you know where he is? And I'll never forget this this one detective said to me, well, you know, two and a half weeks is a long time to be gone for a slap across the face. It's not like he broke your back or anything. And I was incensed, a complete jackass. At this point, the time of this call, I find out after the fact, they've ID'd his body, or they're 90 percent sure it's him and they're they're double checking the the prince with his military records. So he's trying to kind of feel me out and I guess see what I feel or see what I I know or what my affect is like and I would ultimately end up speaking with Virginia Beach Police, the Woodbridge detective that I mentioned earlier, with my divorce counsel uh, present as well as someone else from her firm. My divorce attorney, she really did not want me to talk to anybody and you know at this point I'm naive. I'm thinking, well, if I didn't do anything, like, what's the harm in talking to people? Why wouldn't I try to help them? She said, well, we can talk, but I'm going to be there, and I'm going to have somebody from our criminal department there as well. I'm just answering the question, what was going on with him? What the status of our marriage was like? What was going on at work? Am I telling them I'm having an affair? Absolutely not. Nobody's asking either, so fine. And nobody asked about a gun, but everything else, they actually asked me, they showed me a picture of the luggage. And at first I said, you know, I don't know, it could be ours. It was a very neutral color. Then they said Kenneth Cole, and I thought to myself, you know what, it may very well be. We had a set of luggage. We never friggin' went anywhere. So we're almost never using this stuff. I have no idea what the shit looks like. But I I said, based on the name brand and everything else, that it, it very well could be and that it in fact probably was. So again, I'm not I'm not playing hard to get here. Yes, I am omitting. I'm omitting the affair and I'm omitting the gun, but again, nobody's asking. The wisdom is, you know, the prevailing wisdom is, huh, he wasn't shot. You know, and I said he was the type of person who pissed people off. Because he was. And even his sister said that. You know, he was an abrasive personality and his mouth could start 
a fair amount of, of trouble. So was their luggage missing from their home? Were they able to... They were able to positively state that that was their luggage okay. from their home. Which doesn't really mean much because if Bill left... Did did Melanie say that Bill took suitcases with him when he left? Melanie wasn't sure. She said he packed stuff. He took stuff. She said she would not. She said that she had no idea about these suitcases. I mean, she knew they had a set of luggage. She didn't know whether it was here or there. But she did say they were in the process of moving, so all their stuff was out. She said they both had boxes in their car, bags in their car, clothes in their car. So, so it's possible that these were already in his car and it's totally possible. It's possible they were in his car. It's possible they were not. It's possible that he packed his stuff possible that he did not but it was it is that they were their suitcases yes okay how many suitcases three suitcases three suitcases all part of the like the same set or yes there. okay so it's interesting did you think about when melanie said well i just figured yeah i'm gonna talk because i've got nothing to hide well all innocent people say that right so we know yeah innocent yeah. people are more likely to not request an attorney innocent people are more likely to waive their miranda rights innocent people are more likely, um, unfortunately, even to plead guilty, right? We know there's false confessions, right? So um, really, though, what's more relevant here is the fact that, and anyone could identify with this, if you're innocent, yeah, like if, you, if you're if you in a store and the bells go off that, you know, you stole something and you didn't steal anything, you're like, check my bags, please, right? This just happened to me yesterday, actually, and <laughs> really? I stood there and I did that. I looked at everyone and went, yeah, what? You know what I mean? Yeah, because you want them to feel like idiots because you're like, I didn't do anything, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to hide. Which Melanie says she didn't. She says she cooperated. In fact, uh, during that interview, so I, I think I had heard, I listened to some of what Piquel said about her, mm-hmm. and we get to him later on with the state's case, but I think that he thought it was weird that she would say, you know, he was kind of an, an abrasive guy who would say things were could start a fight. I think it's he, almost like her planting in their head that like, oh, maybe he was met with foul play. Possibly. Or maybe they thought it just wasn't a very nice way to talk about Someone your who's dead. deceased husband. Yeah. Um, so either way is possible. But she also at this time gave them a uh, consent to search her car, um, to search Bill's car, to search the house, to search storage units. Then She's giving that. consent to everything. Yeah, but she's had six weeks to clean up at this point, yes. right? So. Yes. I, you had, would hope that she got rid of anything. She's had plenty of time, but she is giving consent right off the bat. You know, she's opening it up. She's saying, take a look around, whatever mm-hmm. you want to do. So you could say, you know, later on that she's being cooperative here. She's cooperating and she's trying to help the investigation. That's what she said. She details, you know, at one point she drove down the parkway and met one of the cops to give them the keys to a car so they didn't have to bust it open or get a search warrant or do any of this I kind mean, of stuff. I mean, if she was guilty, though... She she would act like this as well, though, because she's not stupid, right? If she was guilty, she would know, oh, it'll be a red flag if I se- if I tell them they can't do this and if perhaps, I don't cooperate. Perhaps, so, yeah. yeah. So she is, you know, she's under this investigation, but, you know, she's had an interview. She's cooperating. She's not particularly worried at this point, I don't think. Plus, she has to go on with her life, right? She has to go back to work. She also has to um, have Bill's funeral. And she talks about Bill's funeral. This was a point of contention, something that was problematic, uh, or she was criticized for a couple of reasons. We had buried him in July, and the arrangements that I made were what my husband wanted, which was burial in a military cemetery, military funeral. That's it. Very, very straightforward. He thought that all of the pomp and circumstance surrounding funerals and headstones and this, he thought it was all just ridiculous. And frankly, he had wanted as a Navy guy to be buried at sea, but um, I couldn't do that. I couldn't put it back in the water. So ultimately, that's that was the arrangement um, that I had made. I had him cremated and laid to rest in a military cemetery. I was later criticized because I did not have my children there, and their pediatrician had thought that it would not be healthy at their age um, with some of the communication issues and delays that they had at that time. They thought you had 60 seconds remaining. They thought it would not be a good time to have them present. Um, I was criticized for not having a long enough service, for not having an ornate enough service, and for leaving before the urn was placed in the ground. And Bill's middle sister, Nancy, looked at me at that service and said, what happened? And that's when I knew she definitely... You have 30 seconds remaining. She 
she definitely had some suspicions. Cindy would come later. Might be irrelevant, but why would they talk about what kind of funeral he wants? They were fairly young and healthy. It just that just seems strange to me that she knew what he wanted. I've heard this before in yeah. cases. Well, I've heard this bef- well, I've heard it argued both ways in yeah. in trials where, you know, a young person dies and a spouse says, "No, we had already talked about that." And you know, the family says, "No way, they discussed that." Yeah. Truth be told, maybe they did, maybe yeah. they didn't. We have no it's, way. I mean, it's not yeah. very relevant, but um I do appreciate the fact that she noticed it. No matter if she was damned if she did, damned if she did. Oh, I think so, too yeah. Too big of a service, too small of a service. Right. At this point, people think it's her. No, she could have done nothing right. I, I think you're probably right. I think she spoke to a pediatrician, you know, two and four years old. I don't. I, I wouldn't I, have my two and four year old at a funeral. I don't think so either. And I've heard people argue, I've heard this argument before, actually. When is too young to bring your kids? Should yeah. kids experience death? Should they know? Should they have a ritual, a formalized, you know, a goodbye? Honestly, I don't know the answer. Yeah. I would have done the same thing, though. I would have consulted a psychologist, yeah. a pediatrician, someone. So, you know, the decision not to bring her small children to their father's funeral, I, I, you know. How would that point to her guilt anyway? You know, I don't even think it's... I don't think it's pointing to her guilt. I think, that, well, I think what they're saying is she doesn't care enough to have even a decent funeral. She doesn't even care for her boys to and say goodbye. And it speaks to her character, I guess they could say. I think so. Um, I know that the funeral was short. I don't know how short. I believe I heard... Bill's friends on one of these Dateline, I keep saying Dateline, but you know, I want to make sure I credit it the right way. It's one of the interviews that they gave. I believe they said the service struck them as very short, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and they were surprised and that they thought Bill deserved better than that. So I think that's a criticism that, you know, this was a very, very short service. It seemed rushed. As Melanie will say later, she didn't, you know, she had lots on her mind. She thought it was just a short thing, what Bill would have wanted. And then I think, look at the end though, Nancy turns to her. This is Bill's Mm -hmm. sister. We don't know if this happened or not, but according to Melanie, why would she again make this part up? Says what happened? So she's obviously suspicious. Well, because she's talking to the police and at the at this point, if the police believe it's Melanie, you know, they're going to tell the family, hey, we're going to get her. This is her. So I don't know if that happened this early on. We don't know. But I mean, yeah. o- either way, Nancy's suspicious. Mm-hmm. Um, Melanie says that Cindy had not said anything up to that point, but very quickly after, yeah. Melanie and Cindy's relationship ends as well. During that time, I mean, life kind of went on. I spoke to Cindy, Bill's sister, every single day. That changed when she wanted me to go to Virginia with her and basically confront the Virginia authorities and demand to know what was being done. And my criminal counsel at that point was like, there's, yeah, there's absolutely no way you're going to Virginia and doing that, clearly. To say nothing of the fact that, you know, I've, I'm working full time, I've got two kids. I've been off all this time because of everything that happened with Bill. It's not like I have a ton, ton of time that I can take off. She wanted to go down there for a couple of days and do this. And the feeling, the vibe was just weird. So when my attorney said, don't do it, I was like, yeah, I, I, I wasn't, I really wasn't going to do it anyway. She was upset with me, um, obviously, for not doing that. At some point, I actually heard from their other sister, their middle sister, Nancy. Nancy basically just confronted me on the phone and said, well, either you did it or Cindy did it. I said, how do you figure that? Like me, I can understand where you might think, okay, the spouse always does it, you know, whatever. But I got to hit the pause button, Nancy. What do you mean, Cindy? And then some diatribe about real estate and commissions, and uh, it was nearly unintelligible. And I know that she had taped the conversation. She said the same thing to the police as well. That's in one of their interview reports. In fact, during the trial, Cindy had been questioned about basically an issue they were having with their mom's estate and how she and my husband decided they were going to mess with their sister Nancy uh, because she was holding things up with the settlement of the estate. So they had literally constructed a list of what they were going to do uh, in terms of teasing her, taunting her. Yeah, it's quite a family dynamic going on there. So I'm the fact that I will go to Virginia with Cindy. That's pretty much the end of our, our speaking. So Nancy and Cindy had a strained relationship this whole time? Or what is that dynamic like? I don't know the dynamic between Nancy and Cindy. Um, According to Melanie, it sounds like they were having some sort of... Well, this is according to Melanie, there had been some strained dynamic relationships in the past. 
Um, well, I guess when Bill's parents passed away, Melanie said, and this again is according to Melanie, that Bill and I guess his sister Cindy were on the same page maybe in selling the estate, but Nancy was holding it up in some way and that they were sort of irritated with this. And so they wrote this note. I think this came out of trial. I think maybe even Cindy testified to this, that, you know, they wrote this note and it was, you know, ways to kind of mess with their sister. And it mm-hmm. seemed kind of mean spirited. Yeah. What do you think about the fact that she wouldn't go to Virginia? Why do you think her counsel advised her not to? Well, they're going to, because if you're a suspect, they don't want you involved. Remember, they don't want you talking to anyone. They don't want you, they're not going to want you involved in the investigation. Absolutely not. I think, I think that makes sense to me at this point. Like she's, she's also not to say the least that she's working, she's moving, she's doing it. I didn't like her excuse there. Like if your husband died, even if you had a strained relationship, it's still the father of your children. Yeah. Talk to your boss with whom you're sleeping with anyway, and you say, I need to take care of some more stuff. I need a few more days off. Her parents could watch the kids. I understand following her counsel's advice. I don't think she needed to throw in all those other excuses about working and kids. Well, look, I think the fact of the matter is she didn't want to go. Yeah, clearly. (laughs) So uh, do I think it's right or wrong? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if she's starting to feel the heat of the investigation. Mm-hmm. If what happened with Nancy or she's, she knows that Cindy's starting to suspect her. Maybe she thinks it's just going to be a really awkward trip with yeah, Cindy. It could be. Maybe she didn't like Cindy. Who knows? We don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't. So I wouldn't make, for me, I'm not making too much of this point that she doesn't want to take this trip to Virginia or doesn't feel like this is the appropriate time for her to be doing this. She doesn't want to do it. So what does she do? What are her moves like over the next few months? Well, she stays with her parents until July 2004 when Melanie rents an apartment in Perth Amboy since that was much closer to her work. She, Did she work in Woodbridge? No, where was RMA? It was close to... But I forgot somewhere the in Middlesex County. Right, okay. yeah, mm-hmm. not far from there. Okay. Um, she was, I mean, she drives a lot, mm-hmm. but you know what? You drive a lot too, I don't do. you? You're always in your car. <laughs> and up until recently, I was driving a lot too, so... yeah. Eventually, Melanie finds a small house in Brick, New Jersey, and this is in April 2005. So this is almost a year later. The house was further from her work, but near a very, very good school for her children, which she said was her primary concern. I don't know what the specific issues were. We didn't talk very much about it, but they were both, they had developmental delays. Mm -hmm. So she needed a good school for them. And she's closer to her parents by being in Brick. That's right. You're a Jersey girl. Yeah, I forgot. Uh, but we should note this puts her further away from work and it puts her further away from Brad Miller. I haven't heard his name in a while. Are they still going strong? They are still together at this point um, and she's not getting any closer to him. What is happening though at this time is that the police are beginning to confront the people in her life, Brad Miller being one of them. They confront Brad. Um, they are confronting, I think, Melanie's brother at one point. They confront Celine's husband. We're talking about, it's been almost a year, though, if I'm correct yes. here. Yes, yes. Okay. They're investigating still. They're taking their time. So she's out and about, and they're really... Well, she's living her life, and they're... She's in, living her life, and they're full... Does she, is she aware that they're investigating her during this year? She knows, yeah. yeah. She knows that she's under investigation. She knows that they're talking to people. She knows that things are happening. She's not... What she's not aware of at this point is after they approach Brad, he begins taping her. He begins recording their conversations. She does not know that. Um, And what does he get from doing that? Well, I think that they uh, approached him. You know, what they're looking for is an accomplice. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that was brought out in trial is is Melanie's small. She's tiny. Could she have done all this? And I think maybe the, I'm not really sure what he gets out of it other than, you know, if you're not involved in this, you wouldn't, you won't have a problem taping her. But he loves her. I'm I'm surprised that he is that he's doing this. I was surprised too. It's a when he's questioned on this, yeah, when he's questioned on the stand, they say, "Were you in love with her?" She, yes, but you still made the recordings. Yes, they also ask him, "Did you continue to be intimate with her while making these recordings?" Yes. <sighs> so he must have believed in her guilt. We don't know. We don't know what he believed, or maybe he believed it would help her to tape the conversations. Maybe he thought she was doing her a favor. Possibly, the conversations did actually help her, or at least they her did. defense would argue that later on. Yeah, every conversation they had. He would, you know, again, say, I'm getting worried. Did you just tell me? And she would adamantly deny, I did not have anything to do with it. Well, she, she's not, she wouldn't it. tell her future, her future husband that she did that because then that would. Well, why else would the police have her recording though? I mean, I it know, has, but I'm saying even if, let's say she did it. Well, it's happened. Not people gonna, have confessed. Yeah, yeah, I people know. have definitely confessed to their, we, that's, that's yeah. certainly happened. Yeah. 
I was just watching a show where the, if someone confessed over the phone, exactly like the police. Especially, had she would say, I did it for you because I love you. You know, if anything, it would be like, yeah. yeah. So, not that it helped her so much, but it, it did. It didn't I mean, hurt her. It, it didn't hurt her at all. Although, no. he did testify for the prosecution. He was their witness. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was, look, they said that he was the motive. Mm-hmm. So, he's their witness. Yeah. yeah. He's testifying for the prosecution. Mm-hmm. So he's taping her at this time, but she's moving on with her life and he's still, you know, he is still involved with her. I don't know how involved with her. So she buys this house, but shortly after she buys the house, she's arrested on June 2nd, 2005. Around mid to late September, a piece comes out in the paper. Who killed the man in the suitcase? It's basically recapping the crime, and Cindy is quoted in the article, and the best thing I could say is she stops just about shy of saying she believes I did it. At this juncture, she has petitioned everybody and their mother, FBI, you name it, and apparently the state attorney general's office has agreed at this point to take it. Now, generally, whatever jurisdiction the body is found in keeps it, but because there didn't seem to be any interest on the part of Virginia, it was handed to New Jersey, and they made the case for jurisdiction based on the fact that Bill had lived here and his car had been found here. Slowly but surely, things are happening. Uh, Friends of mine begin to be questioned. My best friend, Celine, her husband is walking the dogs one morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. Here come detectives out of the bushes to question him. Like, they were trying to really basically take people by surprise, shake whatever trees they could and see what they could get to fall out. We were prepared for this, and we had told everybody close to me, at least least have an attorney on standby that you can call. At least have somebody, just in case, because, again, the, the prevailing wisdom among lawyers is you never talk to the police, which, you know, this is still foreign to me, because in my naivete, I'm thinking, well, if you don't have anything to hide, like, why wouldn't you talk to them? And eventually, they got around to Brad, and they confronted him in a stairwell at work one evening as he was leaving, very dramatic. You know, clearly they're centering on you, and when they confronted Brad, Brad did tell them about the affair. Then they went to Brad's house. Then they went up and down the block to every one of Brad's neighbors showing my picture. What they really were looking for seemed to be an accomplice. They seemed to be looking for a man that they felt could have helped me with the disposal of the body. Circled around inevitably to my parents as well. So quickly, as I was saying, they're looking. I mean, they're going through every male in her life, and they do eventually settle on her father. And I think Mm -hmm. probably because they're ruling out these other guys, right? If Brad's making these tapes, they probably know he's not involved. Yeah. um, Other people they're verifying, you know, their alibis and whatnot. Mm Mm-hmm. They uh, had a, a grand jury convened um, uh, regarding Michael's uh, Michael Caparero, but they did not. They failed to indict him. He's a slight guy as well. Similar, uh, he's yeah. if I recall. Yeah, um, I'm not saying Small that stature. he couldn't. Yeah, um, what yeah. was Bill? His stature like? Um, I believe Bill was very average, male, like five uh, eleven, 180 pounds, okay. something of that nature. Mm-hmm. All right. So now we're we're gonna get into the actual arrest itself right now. How many people are you going to drag into this? I understand why I would be investigated. I understand why I would be a suspect. I get all of that. What I don't get is why I am the suspect. I'm not saying don't look at me, but don't stop with me either. Late 2004, early 2005, and I could be off on the timeline. Eventually, I get a call from my cousin in Pennsylvania, the one whose house Bill and I had our driver's licenses through. And she said the police were just here, and they told us that you bought a gun using this address. So now I know. But again, this is months later. So I know they're investigating me, clearly. But it's like however many months later and you just figured out that there's a a gun in my ownership. So we didn't think that this was something that was pressing. You would have thought that that, had he been shot, this would have been the first thing that they were looking for. But no, it it came up eventually. At this point, my attorney was not allowing me to speak with them. And at that point, the grand juries began. I was actually arrested before I was indicted. So I wasn't indicted until October of 2005. My attorney had told me, prepare, prepare. You know, you prepare for it, but you never really prepare for it. A whole year has gone by. So now at this point, I've bought a house. I mean, I can't live, I can't have my sons living in limbo 
waiting for something that may or may not come. And eventually you get to the point where if you're going to do it, do it already. And you feel like that, and the day doesn't come, and the day doesn't come. And then one day, you drop your children off at daycare, and you come out of the building, and people jump out of the bushes at you. There were state troopers, because I was transported in a state police car. There were detectives. There were, I would say there easily had to be, there were techs waiting to process my car. Had to be anywhere between a half dozen and a dozen people. They were kind enough to pull the blind in my son's classroom so that he didn't see his mother being taken away. To their credit, they let me take the boys to where uh, they were going before they they did all of this that that I will um, give them. She's arrested. I, I think she probably knows that's coming. Whether or not they need to arrest her at her son's daycare uh, yeah. school, I'm not sure they about just, that. I, I guess they knew that she would be there, but they could have just followed her from there and pulled her over. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, at least they took some precautions in making sure yeah. that the sons didn't see her. But so this is it. So she's arrested on June second, two thousand five. Her bail was set at seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. But Melanie is actually able to make this bail really quickly, as we discussed. My bail was listed at seven hundred and fifty thousand. Parents were standing by, waiting. They had a bondsman on tap, ready to go. And on the eve of, of making bail, now we're on Friday the third. All of a sudden, the State Department can't tell New Jersey whether or not I have a passport. I do not have a passport. I've never had a passport, which speaks to you know my my lack of world culture and travel, but. I just I never had one. I never had one. I would think in a post-9-11 world, you're able to ascertain that pretty quickly. Definitely a stall tactic. It became apparent why. The evening of Friday the 3rd, a couple of calls were placed to DICE as Children and Family Services, and there were allegations made against my parents for theoretically being involved in organized crime. And allegations met against me that I was abusing, specifically drugging my children. Now, ultimately, in the end, these play out to be unfounded, meaning absolutely no basis in truth. But because a search warrant has now been executed on my home, my vehicle, my parents' home, because I have been living there, as well as their vehicles, it's enough to get the warrant to get my sons out of the home. And at midnight on Friday, June 3rd, they take those boys sleeping out of their beds to a hospital where they're evaluated, crying for me, crying for my parents. And they take them and they place them with my husband's sister, Cindy, who has not seen them or spoken to them in the 13 months since she's seen their father. I don't doubt for a minute that my husband's sister genuinely believes I did this. And if that's the case, you want me away from these kids. Okay, I get that. How is it not incumbent upon you to make that phone call? Not when I'm about to make bail, but when this is going on. You left these children for 13 months with somebody you thought was a murderer. If I'm truly drugging these children, if my parents are truly doing all of these things, then guess what? It's incumbent upon you to make that call. The fact that you don't is not concern, it's strategy. And Cindy would testify in family court that she timed the calls about the allegations and the removal of the boys to coincide with information that she was getting from the prosecution's office. So eventually it got dropped from an abuse and neglect case to simply a um, child welfare case, meaning were it not for the criminal case, the goal was reunification. They would have returned my children to me. Now I'm fighting on two fronts. And... You know, the, the criminal front is one thing, but, you know, at this point, I'm still naive enough to think, well, I didn't do anything, so, you know, I have nothing to worry about. Now the fight is for the kids as well, but what this is doing is splitting my attention, splitting my resources, and then eventually they did order supervised visitation, and they play keep away with my kids for eight months before they let me see them. Wow, that's intense. In the middle of the night? Yeah, in the middle of the night. Um, and they must be what, maybe three, five, somewhere around there. If my timeline's five. right, they're little kids. They're small, yeah, and they're they're taking them from you know the only parent they know, placing and their grandparents, them, yeah, placing them with an aunt who I don't know how well they knew her or not, but at the time, you know, I don't think they had seen her at all. And if if they saw her, I'm sure it was not for very much yeah. time. So they're placing them. And, and Melanie doesn't see her children for eight months. Wow. But this is all, remember, Amy, this is all when she's not 
been convicted of any crime. So innocent until proven <laughs> guilty, but you can take my kids for eight months and I can't see them. You might argue, okay, but if she's, here's a counter argument, but they believe she's maybe a truly dangerous person. So if she's a truly dangerous person, um, you know, we've seen some of these cases, right? Where, mm-hmm. God forbid, a parent kills their, their kids mm-hmm. and their family. So maybe there's an argument to be made there. Yeah. If they're, if they're worried about that, still supervised visits. Okay. But also, um, if I understood it correctly, she said that the child, the charges in family court got dropped. So yeah, they did. she would only get the kids taken away if she was convicted of murder, and yes. she was. So it actually sounds like that situation was already deemed to be um, it was deemed to be a safe environment for the children. Right. The charges were unfounded, yeah. meaning that they couldn't establish any truth to that. So the only and she concern... wasn't even in jail at this time because no. she made bail. No, but it sounds like the bail. And we can't say this for sure, of course, mm-hmm. but the bail took a little bit longer. And during it, during the time we know when her bail, when she was you know waiting bail, mm-hmm. that they. Dyfus did take her children. Her children were taken away from her. It makes no sense to me as to why they, like you said, wouldn't at least let her have supervised visits during those eight months. Yeah, I don't know what the process is, but that seems like a really long time. I'm wondering, isn't that detrimental to the kids and to their welfare? I would think so, yes. So Melanie has bail, but her life changes a lot after bail. Um, it's, a, it's an entirely different life than she's been used to. I had been asked to surrender my nursing license, given the pending criminal action, which I had done. And so as a result, I actually ended up working. Um, my parents lived down the shore. I was sort of staying between them and my own house at that point. I didn't want to be in the house alone without the kids. You know, I stayed there when my parents had the kids in their home because I, I couldn't be around. I had to be supervised. In any event, I ended up actually working at a restaurant down the shore, living a life that I would have lived at like, I don't know, 22 or 23 years old. I have no husband. I have no children. I have no career. I have no, you know, and I'm living home again, which is what every 30-something-year-old wants to be doing with their parents. In a lot of ways, it was a very good time because I got to concentrate on a lot of things regarding the case. I got to be there and be present when my parents were going through things. But all in all, it was a a lot of hurry up and wait until the beginning of 2007. This is after her arrest. So during this time, she's, you know, gearing up. She's going through attorneys, you know, meeting with attorneys, interviewing them. She's doing trial prep. She's out on bail. So what she's saying is that, you know, she's living an entirely different life. I I think when she said it was a really good time, I don't think she meant like, yeah, I think I was having a great time. I don't think she meant like I'm having a ball, uh, you know, like what was it, Casey Anthony Mm -hmm. and the the Bella Bella Vita or whatever it was. But I think she meant it was good that she was able to participate so fully in her defense. Yep. It didn't get her very far, unfortunately. No, it didn't. But we do know that it's better if people are out and they can participate with their lawyers and meet with them. It it does indicate, you know, it does have better indication. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some ways, Melanie's saying she kind of picked herself up, right? She turns over her nursing license, which she worked so hard for, and I doubt she wanted to give it up, but she did. Mm -hmm. She found the job. She's doing what she has to do. Uh, But what happens is that she, so she was arrested as she said, before she was indicted or before they maybe it, it unsealed the mm-hmm. indictment. The official indictment comes out on October 2nd, 2005. And when it does, there are extra charges in there. And Melanie's bail is now raised to $2 million. This is a substantial jump from 750 mm-hmm. to $2 million. Now, we should point out that most uh, or a lot of murder defendants, when char- when this much bail is assigned, even you know up to a $1 million, they're not able to make bail. No. Nope. So Melanie and was, that I think is part of the purpose of setting yeah. bail that high is you don't want them to make bail. Yeah, that's that's true, right? It's also scaled to the seriousness of the offense. Yeah, although bail was originally intended simply to be you know to return someone to court for flight risk, they mm-hmm. changed the meaning of it uh, as time went on. The cha- you know bail was meant to potentially detain dangerous people mm-hmm. and whatnot. So it it morphed, so to speak. But so Melanie's bail is raised to two million dollars, and she's actually able to make bail again. Her friends. 
her family, her grandparents, they mortgage their houses, and they eventually raise enough bail. It took a little bit of time this time, though. She was, uh, you know, uh, placed back in custody in jail for about two months. So she's indicted. The official indictment has, uh, you know, I think I read some of the charges maybe, or I, I'm going to cover them at some point, but the official indictment, you know, it's for murder. Uh, there's desecration of remains, um, unlawful possession of a weapon, and a couple of other charges. But interestingly, Melanie is indicted for a second time. She's indicted one year later for additional charges of obstruction of justice. I was indicted in October of 2005. That was my first indictment. It was murder, desecration of human remains, a gun charge, and a perjury charge. And that was regarding the restraining order. The second time came a year later. In October of 2006, I'm indicted because uh, a number of anonymous communications had been received by the Attorney General's office and other people and agencies here and there that I'm being charged with, things I would ultimately be acquitted of, but it was enough to add a number of counts to, to the indictment and increase the bail again. My bail is raised to $2 million, so I'm taken into custody at this point. My $750,000 bond is voided, and they take me away. They took me back in. I got out just a few days short of Christmas. What is this perjury restraining order business? Okay, so I asked her the same thing. I'm going through these charges. I'm like, what's the perjury related to? They charged her with perjury because they said her filing for a temporary restraining order was a lie and she had to submit, you know, you have to submit under oath what happened. So they're saying she perjured herself in order to get this restraining order. Which they believe was just a show. Well, yes. So they're saying she lied. She's perjuring herself by getting the restraining order, by uh, giving Mm -hmm. testimony to a judge, a sworn statement, whatever she was to. So that's the perjury charge. Mm -hmm. The second indictment relates to obstruction of justice charges and she just describes it. There were a Anonymous communications that were received by the prosecution to point to someone else as the offender, as a murderer. And so the prosecution says, basically, you know, we're going to charge her with obstruction because this is clearly Melanie trying to throw us off the trail. So she's indicted again. They raise her bail. This time, not much, from I think 2 million to 2.1 million. She's able again to remain free. And this is the last time they're going to indict her. And will we be talking about that letter in more detail later on? Oh yeah, for sure. It's going to come to play a a big role later on as the evidence when we start going through the state's case and the defense. And there's two. There's a letter, but there's also a note. So... There's two important things um, that happen. So these are the obstruction of justice charges. This is the final indictment. During this time, Melanie is preparing, but she's also cycled through a number of different attorneys for a few reasons. I think if I want to make it clear, I think her mom sums it up really nicely why she went through a couple different attorneys and how she came to where she did. First attorney, his wife was sick. He couldn't do it. Then she went to Carluccio. It was a lot of it was money too. Some of them wanted. She interviewed attorneys that wanted like a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. Anyway, how about we went with we were going to go with Paul Bergren? He's now in jail for murdering somebody's uh, witness. Witness, and we were going to go with him. We didn't. That, maybe that was a good thing. We didn't go with him. But anyway, that was when we got Henry. Then we fired Henry. I just saw him in court, and I said to my husband. No, he doesn't have the missing something. Then after Henry, Celine went to work and she lined up Tacopina. She said, we need somebody that's got presence. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from Celine also. She comments on her work in finding Joe. We hit the jackpot, we thought. He's a big shot lawyer. He's in the magazines. He's on TV. He told me that he'd be willing to take the trial if he didn't think he could win, he wouldn't take the trial. He, we knew somebody in New Jersey that he would have to work with in order to practice in Jersey because he was a New York Okay, lawyer. so they're talking about the last attorney, and this would be Melanie's defense team, Joe Tacopina, who is pretty well known. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of him, he's New York certified and he represented some very well-known clients. I believe he represented Foxy Brown. He famously represented Lilo Broncado. I don't know if you guys know him, but Lilo Broncado was in a Bronx tale. He was collegial, and he was also on The Sopranos, who was charged with felony murder, which holds the same penalty. But he did wound up, I think the charges got knocked down substantially, and Lilo Broncado wound up doing about eight years, and he's actually out now. 
Joe also represented uh, Bernard Carrick, Bernie Carrick, who was the New York City police commissioner in 2000. And he was also the commissioner of Department of Corrections. So he's, Celine's right. They thought, you know, they hit the jackpot here and, you know, he's well known. But he's a New York attorney. So he partners with Steve Toronto, who is uh, New Jersey uh, certified. I guess he's, he's, you know, he's the New Jersey guy, right? So the two of them come together and this is Melanie's trial team. Melanie talks a little bit about it as well. Joe was the face of everything. He came highly recommended. He was very charismatic, seemed very knowledgeable. Steve, also a great guy, came off very professional. These are younger guys, so they're, they're not these old, stodgy, you know, like kind of what you think of. These, these guys are hungry. They, it looked like they would be more aggressive in terms, of, uh, in terms of my defense. So this is, for all purposes, her dream team. Um, you know, she went through a number of attorneys, and everyone's helping, and yeah, everyone's going to have an opinion, right? Your mom's going to like someone who seems maybe older and more reliable or, you know, is going to like someone who has more experience. Maybe she likes someone who's younger. I mean, she went through a number of attorneys, some of them just because of price, some of them because she wasn't confident. I would imagine that um, Joe's um, fees are quite high, though, if he has a, a list like that. So I was thinking the same thing in terms of his fees, and this would come up later as well. They had a number that they settled on, and yeah, it was high. It was a number that they had discussed that changed in the middle of the trial, which would become a real significant issue, this idea of a retainer Mm -hmm. agreement. I think what happened also was when she first began, I'm not sure that she understood how complex this would get and what a trial was. And so I think they had an attorney that seemed expensive on the, in the, but they knew nothing at this point. Now we're, you know, they're into this a little bit. Maybe they understand like, yeah, this is a murder trial and this is a really expensive thing. Maybe Joe or someone else was able to explain like, this is what the going rate is for this kind of trial. Everyone feels confident they, that they found the right two attorneys. So what does she do during this time now? So this is all about the trial prep. They are gearing up and they're getting ready. There, Melanie talks about that. I was in the city every week, sometimes multiple days a week with them preparing, basically camping out in the conference room. Discovery is still coming in, right, up until the end, somewhere in the area of over 40,000 pages of discovery. So trying to make sure you have every page, trying to go through the bait stamps, just a lot of mundane kind of paperwork. And then what you're trying to do is identify whatever was problematic for us and figure out how we're going to respond to this. As time is wearing on, though, the, the money is also becoming less and less, and we're, we're trying to decide which are going to be the more essential of the experts. You know, we were, I would say, very much in a defensive posture. Anytime the state identified something that was problematic for us, here we go, we're trying to meet that or to negate that with our own expert testimony. They felt very confident. They felt confident. They wanted to get sort of, you know, kind of ancillary information to sort of back things up that we were asserting, but they had planned the entire time, and they prepped me from the beginning, you will be taking the stand, so get your head right, and, you know, be mindful of it, because the prosecutor is fierce, absolutely fierce, and it would have been nothing nice. From December of 2005 to really, like, January of 2007, there are sporadic hearings, you know, so we'd have a status conference, and then we wouldn't have to be back in court for three and four weeks. You know, they're telling me we're in good shape, we're in good shape, and, you know, the naivete of it is I'm I'm thinking, you know, well, I didn't do anything. That's bound to come, you know, it's, that's going to come out. The truth will come out. Melanie refers to that a lot. She she says her law and order moment's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. But she's feeling good about the trial prep. They're doing all the things that you have to do. It's a lot of digging in. This is the time where, you know, you're looking at discovery, which is seeing the evidence um, that the prosecution has. Discovery goes both ways, but usually it's more about what the prosecution has. And so, you know, they're taking the right steps. They're feeling pretty confident. Melanie is preparing. They have told her, according to Melanie, they've told her that she is going to take the Does stand. Does she end up taking the stand? Well, don't ruin it for oh, everyone, sorry. Amy. Okay. Okay. You'll, have to, you'll have to hold <laughs> on. So we're almost at trial, but she is prepared. And, and Melanie, um, according to her, she wanted to take the stand. She wanted to get up there. She wanted to tell her story. She wants to explain 
And a lot of, we know that probably a lot of defendants feel that way, but there's good reason why their lawyers don't want them to get on the stand. You know, uh, a lot of times that backfires. If they're caught in a lie, if they're impeached, they'll lose their credibility. Even if it's a lie that is so, even you know. Innocuous. Exactly. Messing up dates because it was three years ago. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't look good for them. So they are getting ready and we're almost, you know, we're almost at the trial when the lead prosecutor on this case, Patricia Precioso, makes an announcement. At one point pre-trial, Patty made this announcement about human sawdust. When the indictment was, you know, unsealed, that was the, the big reveal. There's, there's this human sawdust in the car. We've got this DNA now. You know, aha, we've got our, our forensics, basically. There had been connective tissue found in the front seat, the driver's seat, as well as the passenger seat of Bill's car and that this was completely dispositive of me and perhaps an accomplice tracking this this tissue into, you know, Bill's car from some purported dismemberment or something to that effect. But it was just, it was extremely overwhelming. And just like that, the prosecution has their smoking gun, otherwise known as forensic evidence. Next time on Direct Appeal... The trial against Melanie McGuire begins on March 5th, 2007, and the state lays out their theory on how Melanie planned and carried out the murder of her husband, Bill McGuire. Direct Appeal is hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga. The story arc was written by Megan Sachs. Music and underscore by Dessert Media. Recorded, mixed, and edited by Justin Crowell at JC Studios. Special thanks to Alan Tuckerman, whose work was integral to this production. If you have a tip, you can submit through our website or by emailing tips at directappealpodcast.com. 